Yep, I hear uh, when you're standing there, I do, yes. Right, I'll start the intro then. Okay. okay, hang on, let me just get back over to you. Uh, there we are. Okay. Um. Colleagues, uh, welcome to our final session at Alt-C 2015. Um, so I'm delighted that our keynote speaker is Phil Long. Uh, Phil has been associated with a host of learning technology initiatives including advising the New Media Consortium. And uh, if you've seen his uh, biography within the program, you'll see how far his uh, influence extends. And Phil was previously director of the Centre for Educational Innovation and Technology at the University of Queensland, and he's currently associate vice provost at the University of Texas, Austin, from where he's joining us today. So, Phil, we are looking forward immensely to hearing your thoughts about uh, the future of learning technology. Uh, over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, hopefully, you're hearing my audio reasonably well. And what I'd like to do is um, switch over to the screenshot of my desktop, which should give you a gorgeous view. Oops, the screen just... My camera just got moved around, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, a gorgeous view of the um, of this night sky, and from there, I hope that you'll see my first slide. Is that aff affirmative? Yep, we're good. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit today. I'm going to try to keep this short, so there's opportunities for question, and it's the end of a long conference. Um, but first of all, I wanted to thank uh, you all for inviting me to speak at Alt C. And after hearing and seeing the uh, pr presentations by uh, Laura and Rebecca and Jonathan and Steve, um, I have to say I'm a bit concerned to be the cleanup uh, player at this particular conference, but I will do my best. And a special thanks to Amanda, who was uh, a delightful presence uh, at the University of Queensland when I was down there, and she was able to join us for a while. Um, and uh, and found the uh, the concert, the presentations and work that she was doing with us was terrific. Uh, so thank you, Amanda. Um, let me start by just giving you a brief uh, narrative arc of what, um, what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk a little bit about performance versus learning. Uh, the theme of this talk, as you saw from the original slide, is in fact, why are we not using what we really know about cognitive science and learning uh, as well um, as we should, both in terms of the way we design uh, presentations uh, and engagements in classes, as well as the way in which we um, design and build our tools for facilitating learning. So the narrative arc of this talk is to talk a little bit about the distinction between performance versus learning, which is, I think, a major problem that we have today. Um, secondly, a few examples of what we really do know from over a hundred years worth of cognitive science and learning research is effective and works and some of the issues that it presents. Um, I'll segue briefly to a bit on metacognition and the, the self-awareness or the learner's awareness of their own abilities, uh, which is, let's say, the depressing part of the talk and then move to a little bit more optimism, I think, around transcendent motivation, which I think is going to help us as we move forward. And then I'll conclude with a few um, questions uh, for you to think about.
So the next step, let me ask this initial question, and the initial question is what I started with, is why aren't we building the digital tools for learning environments uh, with knowledge of and incorporation of what we know about learning science? And of course, why are our course designers and classes uh, equally uh, of not taking advantage of that of that understanding? And there's a good reason for that, I think. Uh, but first, let me talk about what I mean about learning. And so in this case, um, I'll grab from uh, the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, the definition of learning as uh, the acquisition of knowledge or skills through experience or study, as in being taught. And then a little bit more clearly, I think, uh, from a more recent article this last year, this current year, by Soderstrom and Burke, uh, Bjork, um, learning reflects the relatively permanent changes in behavior or knowledge that support long-term retention and transfer. And therein lies the rub, long-term retention and transfer. So we know what we seek about learners in terms of learning. At least most of us um, who teach have an idea of what we're trying to accomplish. In this particular case, um, again from Soderstrom and Bork, students can use information in available context use the refer the cues available to reconstruct knowledge to meet the demands of a present activity. Now that's distinct from performance, which are temporary fluctuations in behavior or knowledge that can be observed and measured during or immediately after that initial acquisition process. And that is a key distinction. Now learning involves multiple types, of course, things like latent learning. learning. Latent learning consists of learning that you actually do without really being, being aware of it. If you happen to be walking through a park, for example, um, uh, waiting for somebody, the reality is that you are picking up attributes of the park, the people there, the location of objects in the park and things like that. And if someone asked you later, you would be able to tell them something about that, even though there was no overt reinforcement for the idea of learning anything while you were in that park. On the other hand, overlearning is when you present someone with a series of act tasks and they practice those tasks, uh, they get rewarded for those tasks, and they begin to demonstrate um, uh, competency in that they can reliably reproduce or act on or, or uh, use that knowledge in an effective, consistent way. Oftentimes, that's where we and our students stop. Overlearning is the continuation of that process well beyond that demonstration of initial competence and mastery. Um, a classic experiment uh, in this had to do with um, over learning a series of words in a, um, in a list, um, the classic psychologist ploy, and for doing that with one group. Um, where they had to learn a the list and recall all the words. In another group, there was a control group who did the same thing. The difference between the control and the treatment is that the control group stopped their learning process when they demonstrated 100% recall and that mastery of that. The overlearning group continued that uh, uh, practice um, and did so for another 27 days. Then they then came back uh, and did a retention test, and the people in the overlearning group were much, much more, more uh, uh, capable of re remembering those activities. Indeed, if you did the same thing and you just let an hour pass, just any period of time, the people in the overlearning group significantly improved uh, their performance relative to the people who stopped after the initial mastery. And finally, fatigue learning I don't have to talk about because that's what we usually do every day of the week since we're usually fatigued when we're learning in our typical work days and our school site environments. But you know what I'm talking about. You're learning even though you're tired and the like. We tend to think we're not, in fact, picking things up as well as we otherwise would. We're actually doing better than we think. And fatigue learning does, in fact, result in reasonable retention. Now... The thing is, is that with uh, learning, whether it's latent learning, fatigue learning, whatever type of, of learning that we're talking about, we can have learning taking place, as in latent learning, with no discernible changes in performance. That is to say, when I'm walking through that park, uh, I'm not changing my behavior because of the things I'm picking up, but if you ask me later about attributes of what I saw, I will be able to tell you. Um, if the converse is also true, 
That is, I can in demonstrate improved performance and yet fail to significantly learn in the terms of long-term retention anything. And we all are experienced with that because all of us have, have administered and or taken midterms and finals and the week there or two weeks thereafter, the, um, the retention of that material is often poor if, if non-existent. And finally, uh, we can discern sort of the most interesting thing that there are certain manipulations that have opposite effects on learning. Things that really, really make uh, performance effective but learning non-existent and things that really affect learning but performance isn't so good. And the latter, when things affect uh, learning but performance isn't what we would like, is in fact one of the major issues that we have to confront. <laughs> Now let me talk about a couple of the things we know extremely well, and you've all probably been uh, well schooled in this, but I just want to mention that things like space practice. So Rohr and Pashler did a, a very simple study on space practice using a very common paradigm. You study a material for a period of time, you leave a gap, you restudy the material, you have another gap, and then you have a test that you present to understand whether or not they were able to reconstruct what you were trying to teach them. So. The thing that's key about this is that it's not a linear relationship. So uh, Cepeda and the others in 2008 looked at 1,354 study participants in a study and they presented them with a range of time frames, study gaps that range from 20 minutes to 105 days and followed that by tests for some as short as uh, seven days after and to others as long as 350 days after and the various st spots in between. The optimal uh, study uh, gap that's, that's listed there is shown by that red curved line on the saddle. And the point of this, um, of this slide is really to convey that there is in fact a nonlinear relationship between study gap and test delay so that, as you see in the saddle, it looks like it's between 5 and 10 percent of the test delay is the optimum uh, gap in that study for this particular uh, experiment. So we have to be mindful that memory retrieval and performance of long-term uh, activities, long-term learning, is not a simple linear function. In addition, we have things that we know very well about uh, variable or interleave practice a couple of classic experiments, one of which is really very relevant to uh, the higher education environment, um, in which there were students that were pre presented with opportunity to study for an exam and they were given the opportunity to study for the exam twice. In one case they studied in the same room each time. In the second case they studied twice but in each uh, in the second room for the for the treatment group they studied in a different location, a, a classroom, but a different classroom that's, as the images sort of depict. And the test was taking place in a finally in a third space altogether. And the students that study the same material, the same length of time, uh, same study gaps, etc., who changed rooms between in the second study interval performed significantly better than those that stayed in the same environment. Again, an example of interleaved mm -hmm. practice. Another example which is um, from the studying of art where in an art class uh, students viewed paintings from 12 different artists with similar styles and they viewed them in either what they referred to as a blocked or a interleave fashion. The block session, all of the artists' paintings as a group were, were looked at for a period of time. So the artist may have had five different paintings and they looked at the variations in that particular artist and they looked at another artist for five and off they went and um, continued that process. In the interleaved, they randomly mixed the art paintings from the different artists as they did the study, again, over the same number of paintings and the same number of artists. But when the tests were done, the people that were in the interleaved treatment perform significantly better in able, being able to discriminate who the artist was responsible for the painting. And, fi and finally, I'll look at an example from Roran Taylor from 2007. This is a college students who were looking at finding the volume of four obscure geometric objects, one of which is shown on the screen, and then completed one of two randomly assigned practice, uh, assign, uh, practice schedules. So you see the geometric object here, a cylinder where the student is supposed to calculate the volume of the wedge, that cross-hatched area on the screen. The student is um, presented with uh, the same practice problems uh, where each group of students worked on the same practice problems, but either the practice problems were blocked, four problems for one solid, four problems for another solid, etc., or systematically mixed. 
both these mixers and blockers completed two practice sessions the same length, separated by a week, and tested a week after. That is the same old methodology we just described a minute ago. Set one interleaved, set one grouped, wait a week, same practice, same pattern, then do a test. The results, and this is what's really interesting here, during practice, the mixers didn't do nearly as well as the people studying in blocked activities. Now that's challenging because that means the people who are doing that interleave study, when we just described, typically do better when you do the tests, are finding that their reinforcement in their study activity is very much less than the reinforcement that the individuals in the blocker group are getting. So when they did the actual test, you see that the performance on the test, their accuracy for the mixers, is much higher than those in the block group. And herein lies the conundrum. That is to say, we know something about the studies that really works. We know something about what works for performance and longer uh, versus longer-term retention. The problem is, is that we want to presumably ad address the issues of longer-term retention, but the reinforcements and the, and the affective experience of the learning process are telling the students that it is not working for them and not working as well. So that is, effective practice is not intrinsically motivating. Now, why has it taken us so long to recognize the superiority of some of these things like overlearning or latent learning with repeated trials, frequent testing, the spacing effects, et cetera, et cetera? And more importantly, why aren't we building these, these char characteristics into the digital tools that we're using? Well, part of it is because the reaction of our students is not pleasant. <laughs> our students are not particularly happy with the fact that they're getting um, uh, results which are not what they're, lo they're looking for as they are studying, but they may be getting results in the final exams or the midterms, etc., that are better. It's just difficult for them to see the connection, and certainly when you're not feeling reinforced in the process. So they will choose studies that lead to suboptimal long-term results if we don't do something different as we're going through this learning process. This is what Bork calls building pattern, learning patterns that contain uh, desirable difficulties. And you've heard that phrase before. Um, it's a big element influencing learning acquisition and performance. And one of those, desire, those, those activities that does that is this recognition of one's own abilities. And that's in terms of, of uh, metacognition. So we know what makes things work. The question is, do we want better test scores or better learning? For better test scores, we know the things that will affect and improve performance. It's more reinforcing for students, and it doesn't necessarily help learning in the long term. One of the painful things about our time, according to Bertrand Russell, one of my favorite uh, uh, scientists and, and, and authors, is that we feel s certainty, those of us, rather, that feel certainty are um, are stupid, and those with imagination and understanding are filled with doubt and indecision. And there is a challenge for us. Metacognition, that aw awareness of our abilities or awareness of things around us, give us that sense of either certainty or uncertainty. It's our understanding of our own thought processes. Now, there's a a long-running national public radio program in the U.S. Uh, by Garrison Keillor, um, and um, it's referred to as a prairie home companion. I'm sure you can hear it on the, on the web. Um, and one of his taglines is about the, uh, the mythical community in northern Minnesota, a Lutheran community primarily, um, where he describes all the men are strong, the women are good looking, and the children are all above average. That's actually uh, a good example of a problem with metacognition. In fact, our college professors, my colleagues, uh, have the same problem because his survey back in 97, uh, 77 by Cross showed that 94% of them believe that they are doing above average work, a figure that obviously defies mathematical plausibility. Now, this is where our first video comes in, and I will ask Martin to play a, a well-known um, psychology um, uh, amateur, shall we say, who has a, a, a very useful um, description of work by a researcher named David Dunning in the U.S. at Cornell University about metacognition. Martin?
And the problem with people like this is that they are so stupid that they have no idea how stupid they are. You see, if you're very, very stupid, how can you possibly realize that you're very, very stupid? You'd have to be relatively intelligent to realize you're stupid. There's a, a wonderful bit of research by a guy called David Dunning at Corbell, who's a friend of mine, I'd rather say, who's pointed out that in order to know how good you are at something, it requires exactly the same skills as it does to be good at that thing in the first place, which means, this is very funny, that if you're absolutely no good at something at all, then you lack exactly the skills that you need to know that you're absolutely no good at it. And this explains not just Hollywood, but almost the entirety of Fox News. <laughs> so, um... I think that that's a, a relatively fair summary of Dunning's work. Um, Dunning and Kruger back in 99 um, looked at the performance of students both uh, in tests and what they actually did was they asked the student to describe how well they thought they answered a particular question as they were doing each question and then they asked them to place themselves as the F when they were done in a distribution about where approximately relative to their peers in the class they felt the results of their test scores would place them. And what they found was that the top 25% tended to think that their skills lay in the 70 to 75th percentile, uh, although their performance fell roughly in the 87th percentile. Now Dunning and Kruger suggested that this underestimation by that top group of students was because the top performers uh, find the tests that they were doing easier and therefore assumed mistakenly that their peers also found the tests easier. Whereas the students in the lowest quart, uh, quartile viewed as they were giving their individual answers that they did reasonably well and placed themselves in the upper uh, two-thirds of the, court, of the uh, class distribution when in fact they performed in the lower 25%. And this is true with students in class. He's got, they've gone out to look at people in real-world training environments, in sporting environments, the same kinds of things. And it's an incredibly robust finding and an incredibly depressing finding because it's also the case that very little has been found that will actually be a, that actually results in, uh, in interventions that can modify that misperception of one's metacognition. Now, um, are you, I'm, some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Serigo, but uh, since I can't see you at the moment, I'm just going to assume that the ant it, Can someone tell me whether there's a, rel a relatively uh, wide recognition of what Serigo is? Hands up if you know Serigo. We have no hands. No hands. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, it's actually something that comes out of the uh, predecessor of language learning tools. Um, I'm, what I'm going to show you next, or what Martin will show you next, is a is two set of clips. The first one is from the Serigo vendor describing what the tool does. And the second one is from its implementation in a UTX, that is the uh, University of Texas Austin edX MOOC course. Um, by a colleague in jazz who used it as a, as a tool. Um, but the, the essence of Serigo is that it tries to, def to define the memory decay curve unique to you for particular kinds of learned material. And thereby, by, having, by doing that, it then uses that decay curve information to, to pull back information and represent it to you at the point at which from the decay curve uh, it appears that you would be starting to lose it. So it's a way of reinforcing based on your own memory for particular kinds of things. So go ahead and play the next video. Every time it's done with the system assigns a learning strength to each of your items based on a number of factors, such as last time seen and cumulative performance. The system then selects which items are most urgent for at that moment and creates a lesson for you with these items. This urgency battle that takes place between all your items allows us to determine what information you most need to see at any given moment in time. And by presenting that information to you at that very moment, we give you the best chance of consolidating it as long-term knowledge. Okay, so you get the general idea of how the tool works. Now let's look at the way um, Jeff has embedded it in his edX course. To get started with Serigo, go to the subsection that takes you to the set you wish to study. The titles of these sections begin with the word practice and are followed by the title of the particular set you will be studying. 
Going to each section will launch the learning application, customized to your progress, directly on the edX site. Each set of items corresponds to the learning goals of the course. Serica will first present you with the information to be learned and show you the correct answer for each of the items. It will then begin asking you questions that demonstrate your knowledge of the items. By answering questions correctly, you will make progress towards memory permanence. But there are much more than just questions and answers within the set. You will find vivid notes attached to each item, accessed by clicking the Notes tab at the top of each item. That consists of explanations of the correct answer, additional information about the topic, images, and audio excerpts. So, there you hear um, Jeff, who is using Jeff Helmer, who is using that in his class as a means of trying to reinforce particular attributes associated with um, with the uh, the recall of musical styles, with performance characteristics, with characteristics of um, of instruments, etc. And it seems to have worked quite well. Now you can get a synopsis. These are both of the Serago tool and a whole slew of other ones are uh, summarized in a relatively recent uh, March 2018 um, slide, uh, or just rather presentation from Ithaca. That's Ithaca with a K. This is the research group um, on personalized learning and an overview of those technologies. And Serago, uh, Smart Sparrow, um, Leap. And a host of these tools are among the emerging crop of, of um, applications which are trying to take what we know about learning and both in the neurophysiological sense in terms of memory decay and such, but also in terms of space practice and the like and build them into adaptive learning pathways. Uh, separate talk about my concerns about adaptive learning uh, in the context of social learning, but that's, that's for another time. Now, one of the reasons why these tools are coming out there and are, we're able to begin to take advantage of them is, uh, is the emergence of an interoperability standard in the technology side called LTI. And LTI is simply a standard by which a tool provider and a tool consumer interact with each other in such a way that the learner does not have to do a series of um, redundant tasks in terms of identifying and authenticating himself or herself when the tool is brought up. So what's um, the reason I wanted to raise this LTI tool and both Serago and SmartSpro and all of the rest of these things are available in LTI contexts is because we're starting to see the emergence of a dynamic and vibrant developer community which is being able to which is being fostered by the uh, the ability to make an application which can plug into the LMS of your choice and by doing so create a market for um, experiments in the use of more effective implementations of cognitive science and learning where there is now a market big enough to be able to support these experiments. I'm not going to go into the details of, of how the whole thing works. Uh, we can talk about that afterwards if you like, but this is really significant and therefore I encourage you to be thinking about this on your campus in terms of policies for the use of LTI tools and uh, the issues that surround their effective uh, and safe implementation. You'll have questions that you'll need to ask about well, where does the data get stored, what's their policy for retention, what's their uh, use of that data if they are trying to make use of it on the side, et cetera, et cetera. But again, that's for another time unless you want to deal with that in a question later. Okay, so I talked to you about the, the, about the um, metacognition stuff and as well as the um, the, what we know about learning and how what we know about learning gives us uh, some concern because the things that really tend to work are not well reinforced emotionally and, and, and in um, students' experience with those learning practices. But there is reason for optimism. And this involves this notion of embracing a virtuous cycle in our teaching. This is very recent work by uh, David Yeager, um, by uh, Carol Dweck, um, by um, a host of researchers in the in the space that's often referred to as uh, studying grit or um, or various things along those lines, um, and in the process um, there is a, has emerged this notion of self transcendent motivations for learning. This is an interesting study that David and company has done, Angela Duckworth and a whole host of folks, um, and it's addressing that problem we've just been describing. Many important learning tasks are uninteresting, they're tedious, they're boring. Uh, 
And this tends to result in their being um, performed with less frequency and less intention than they should be, even though they're absolutely essential. So this is a paper that um, I'm going to be talking about to the last part of this talk, relatively recent. The title of the topic is Boring But Important. Now, what they did in this talk, in this presentation, they did a whole set of four experiments. And what they did was they had, student, they had students, uh, and these were high school students in this particular case, um, that were presented results from a survey that communicated to them motives for why they might be willing to learn or wanting to learn. Things like personal self uh, uh, motives, like making money, um, getting, getting freedom in their ability to choose work. Um, but some students, most students actually, uh, even if sometimes secretly, are also motivated to do well even in spite of the social pressures in high school uh, and do well in order to gain skills that can be uh, used for pro-social ends. Survey statistics are presented to recip uh, participants that indicate that most students were motivated to do well in high school, at least in part to gain knowledge so that when they can have a career that they are personally enjoying and satisfied by and, and to learn so that they can make a positive contribution to the world. That's a message that a set of survey statistics were presented back to these learners. The summary statistics were accompanied by representative quotes purportedly from upperclassmen at the schools reinforcing this so a social message. For example, for me, getting an education is all about learning things that will help me do something I can feel good about that matters to the world. I used to do my schoolwork to earn just a better grade and look smart. I still think doing well in school is important, but for me, it's not just about the grade anymore. I'm growing up, doing well, and preparing myself to do something that matters, something I care about. That is a quote of a student, upperclassman, that these students got in a survey response. In fact, the survey response and these quotes are manufactured. They are, they are simply created to generate this perception of, of a transcendent motivation. To facilitate internalizing this message, the students were asked to explain how they would help uh, how they would help be the kind of person they wanted to be or help make the kind of impact they wanted to make in, around people and society in general. So they had to write two to four sentences in general um, and in this way they were being, uh, instead of being passive recipients of the intervention, the students themselves effectively authored uh, the intervention. So they were allowed to make uh, both the messages personal and persuasive to the self. The primary dependent variable in the study um, is, a, is remarkably, uh, these are courses in STEM classes, science, technology, engineering, and maths, uh, were the grade point averages that the students got in the fourth grading period of the year. That assuming that low achieving math and science students might be more likely to, do, uh, to be tested um, about the purpose of their learning and that that would have the, the greatest impact would be on those with the math scores that were lowest and science scores that were lowest in this pre-intervention. So they focused on the students that were doing least well in this intervention scheme. They controlled for race, gender, IQ, and, and a sundry other variables that you might think would influence these results. And the results that they achieved are pretty astonishing. So you see here that on the left side, you have all students and of 338 in this particular uh, cohort and students with uh, poorer grades. In this case, the grading uh, is a, the three represents a B in this particular grading schema. So things that people who got less than a B, there was a significant standard deviation, um, a lack of overlap, therefore significant result for those students who had the intervention as opposed to uh, those students that didn't. The point of this study, this is a second of a set of four, is that by purposefully articulating the learning goals and outcomes in a more transcendent way, they could in fact significantly improve their performance. So does this purpose narrative that uh, keep the students focused on the study in the face of competing more desirable alternatives. They actually then presented the same experiment, but they gave students a whole set of boring math problems and a screen that allowed them to either do the math problems by going to the left side of the screen or had Tetris playing on the right side of the screen. And they were told, you can play Tetris if you want. That's no problem. That's OK. These are just practice study press, uh, questions, but they are useful for learning the material. 
And when they did that, they found that those students that were doing those math problems um, f in the control group, they had a, a first set of uh, students that were doing, there was, there was no difference in block one. Block one happened to be uh, with no interventions whatsoever. Um, and in, this, in block two, um, they had the intervention with that virtuous transcendent set of messages where they presented the students with the description of upperclassmen's survey results, then quotes from those upperclassmen, and then they asked the student to write a quote for, about how they might consider being uh, more capable of helping each other, themselves and others. And indeed, the numbers you see there, 37 and 56, those are the actual number of pro problems they performed on the math side. So the people that did the... Um, uh, that had this, this treatment that was the virtuous reinforcement of transcendent learning actually performed almost double the number of problems that were the boring problems in the face of that con context. And they described them when asked about them in a different way. They actually described them as being, well, they weren't very interesting, but I know it was important for me to be able to manipulate these, these, these equations in order to be able to learn the, the material for later use. So, I want to give you some closing thoughts. I just want to re-emphasize how impre impressed I am by this set of studies. It's a huge study. Um, I, I suggest you take a look at David Yeager's work, um, and it gives you some really uh, positive, uh, opt optimistic uh, suggestions for ways in which we can um, motivate students to do the kind of things that we know work for longer term learning but which are not reinforcing necessarily by just presenting the rote activity for them. So closing thoughts. New digital tools are decomposing integrated learning systems and that's one of the reasons why that LTI environment has led, for that, led to that explosion of new tools that allow experimentation to actually be tried out in real world contexts with enough of a market uh, for them to be su uh, supportive. The LTI issue on your campus is something you need to really be thinking about. Um, there's a caution, one of the very common LTI tools out there is something called Piazza for discussion, discussion boards and such. Uh, what you may not know is that the back end data that Piazza collects on the students who put their posts in the, in the discussion board are actually mined and sold to businesses and that's their business model. That's how the Piazza tool is free. Uh, they have in the U.S. refused to sign the FERPA agreement on federal privacy protection of individually personally identified data and um, at least our institution is banning its use. So we talked about adaptive tools. So I give you an example of one of the set of adaptive tools and personalized learning tools. And the question I raise there in terms of where you stand on that is because um, personalized learning tools are very much oriented towards the individual learner. And the question that it raises is are we Cre are we creating a learning environment that uh, Sherry Turkle has called being alone together, uh, ignoring the value and the importance of the social context of learning by creating these personalized learning pathways which have very effective or potentially effective uh, implementations of cognitive science in the actual way in which learning is presented, but in fact may not take any advantage of or the uh, capabilities of the sociality that we know is important in learning as well. Um, and so that's something to be thinking about. This leads you to, of course, step, take a step back and ask, what is your ideal learning environment? What is your theory of learning? And, of course, the classic from James Galbraith, uh, Garfield was two people sitting in a hut, one on either side of a log, and the instructor at one end, the learner on the other, and they're just having a conversation. And that is this particular idealized view of learning. It's a very romanticized view of learning and one in which I think many faculty actually ultimately have, but which isn't necessarily helpful in thinking about how their students perform or the kinds of exercises that need to be designed to make them perform better. And finally, in the face of this expansion um, of um, the scale of our institutions, that is the size of the number of students we have to, turn, uh, to teach, etc. University of Texas at Austin has 54,000 students uh, residentially on campus. What are we doing to bring good learning science into elegant learning environments that fits our culture? And this is, going, of course, the, the most challenging aspect of this. A culture at UT is relatively conservative. It's relatively uh, focused on um, providing students with an instrumental learning environment and there are of course 
examples of progressive work and such, but I would say that lecture still holds a particularly dominant place, and that's in part because it's a very research-intensive university, and we know as a lecturer, as a faculty member, how to do that type of teaching and get out and go back to our research, which is where our rewards come from. So that's where I want to leave you with the notion that we know a lot about cognitive learning. We know a lot about the ways in which uh, the process of doing so is effective and not necessarily individually reinforcing for students as they're performing it. We know we have to think about ways in which we can address that. Some of the adaptive learning tools are trying to do just that. And more importantly, some of the most recent research by people like David Yeager and Carol Dweck and uh, Angela Duckworth and others are suggesting that there is a possibility of using metacognition in a way we weren't really thinking about to change the perception of students about their own motivations for learning by uh, engaging them in thinking in a context which they actually bring to the table, but we don't reinforce. And with that, I'll say thank you. We hope we, we may have lost Phil, but uh, I hope you heard the uh, round of applause. We're now seeing whether we can reconnect for some questions. That would be unfortunate if we've lost him. He had this problem when he ever uh, closed PowerPoint, it would crash his Hangout for some reason. I guess Google and uh, um, Microsoft weren't playing nice. <laughs> Perhaps they were listening to him. Yeah. Right. We'll have to see whether he... Perhaps I can put you on the spot, Amanda. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we do have a mic, so if people want to quiz you, what, that's possible. What, 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 <laughs> Yeah. Here he is. We've got Bill back. Hi hey there. Um, and I have no idea where I left off. You, you got to the very end. It was wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Remarkable. Fine, thank you. And we were just applauding and you disappeared. But uh, hey, it's good to have you back. <laughs> that was not meant to be a statement. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've got time for just a few questions. So uh, do we have... Uh, we have a microphone, a couple of microphones going around. Uh, comments or questions for Phil? Hello, Phil. It's Dan and Laura Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, fine. You started off with a very good question about how come we're not using what we know from learning research in the way that we develop and design um, learning tools, digital tools and environments. And then, kind of towards the end, you kind of often answered that question because you were talking about the way in which some of the studies don't address the social aspects of learning. And of course, that is a very important part of the, the cognitive learning that we do. And the, the, the kinds of studies that you quoted, I mean, the, the, the Yeager stuff I think is probably different, but some of the earlier results that you were quoting such piecemeal types of learning, mm -hmm. decontextualized, not the kinds of things that, that people in our kind of feel uh, kind of warm to or are interested in, you know, we're working much more in the real world of, of what students are actually trying to learn in the context of their degree programs or whatever. So I'm just wondering if you could comment on the, the types of uh, studies that we should be paying attention to. And, and would you agree that there are some of those that you know, aren't that helpful, really? Some of those that are, say the last bit again? That aren't really that helpful. Um, yes, I mean, so. I think that those the things that you described as as um, piecemeal or decontextualized um, are are still important because the actual um, demonstration of a particular phenomenon or effect are things that we are um, 
that we need to take into account when you bring the student into the richer, um, interactive, more um, more complex learning environment. I mean, just for example, that notion that that um, studying in multiple locations facilitates uh, acquisition as opposed to studying in the same place in the same way over and over again, and then putting yourself ironically in a new test environment, in a new environment for the actual test. Um, I mean, that's something that, that, on the one hand, you could say is a very sort of decontextualized um, and, and carefully controlled experiment, but one which actually says a lot about what we advise our students to do when we're asking them to prepare for exams and things. And that would be, you know, go, actually, when you do your study, go around to different places, put yourself in distant situations, find out where the exam might be, and replicate that environment when you're studying as well, because you'll find you'll do better. So there are certain things about those decontextualized studies which I think do still have context. But nevertheless, I think I take your point, and I think it's a very good one. There are people that are trying to be much more real uh, and um, and much more um, um, contextual in the sense of providing ways in which students can be given guided learning experiences that c pertain to actual uh, uses of those uh, of that learning in particular ways that they will practice per potentially in the future which is why we are so interested in for example active learning um, and performance particularly in the STEM fields that give students an opportunity to engage in the kind of learning thinking and in, and study experiment environment which we think is where their uh, discipline is taking them and doing that as early as possible because we know that those that context of that learning in, the, in that way even though they may not be able to perform at nearly the level of others who have been practicing in that context for a long time nevertheless that context has all of those other capabilities around the latent learning that's going on the, the social interactions that are that are that are happening in that context etc which will be extremely valuable um, Duckworth stuff um, um, David's stuff, David Yeager's stuff, etc. I think are really trying to keep that forward thinking embedded learning environment of the real world at the forefront and nevertheless engaging in some very point interventions to construct a framework of thinking while the students are engaged. It's just remarkable to me how, how much of an impact those things have had uh, in the experiments that they've done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another, have we got another question, comment? Yes. Have, uh, just getting the microphone there. I, I can see, I can see. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, thank you, that was so interesting. Um, I was wondering about, uh, about cognitive science in other disciplines than some of the ones that depend very heavily on memorization. So some of the some of the subject areas depend on relating ideas to each other and synthesizing new ideas or um, coming up with critiques. Uh, what do we know about those in cognitive science? Would some there was enough echo that I'm I'm having real trouble deciphering that. Can someone repeat the question directly into the uh, Mike, uh, perhaps Amanda, could you repeat it? Maybe just uh, Can you hear me now? I'll try to no, repeat it again. Um, no, if Amanda, just speak to it into the microphone. Right. Uh, Can you remind me? It's the cognitive science. Um, and it's to do with uh, things that depend on relating ideas to each other. Maybe ideas or right. theory. Yes, yeah, so moving away from the STEM subjects into those which um, embrace more the humanities and social sciences. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what about cognitive science and its applications there? Well, um, so for example, um, I mean, the brief, the brief vignette that you saw from the jazz class sort of fits that, uh, where they took advantage of, of um, a series, the way that tool works it gives the students a series of, of questions and tests along different um, aspects of music in this case um, and then tests them over a period of, of, of time and in the process draws 
for every individual its own um, learning deca um, memory decay curve associated with topic areas of questions, and in the and then it uses that to re as the met trigger for the reinforcement cycle for those kinds of concepts as the course progresses. So that's an, that's an example outside of the of the STEM sciences. But I think the other areas that you're thinking about, for example, um, uh, I'm working with someone in the uh, theater and dance program here who is using um, drama drama and dance as a pedagogical motivation uh, for, for, for training teachers. Um, I think that there's a lot to we, we can understand about the social, about the um, engagement that learners, that um, uh, cognitive science has in terms of the connection between proprioceptive and body movement and memory, the relationship between um, affective states that are engendered. I mean, the whole um, drama-based instructional paradigm is, is around the notion of, in, of heightening particular emotional associations with, with, with learning. And that connection is something I think cognitive science has a lot to say about. Um, one of the things we want to do is, is actually uh, instrument her as she's teaching so that um, we actually get a three-dimensional representation of her movement and of her voice, of her, uh, her voice modulations, her, the decibels of her voice and things like that, to be able to see whether we can distinguish those patterns and their relationship in students that, are, that she's engaging with and uh, make a connection between things that we can measure about her activity and performance and the learning that the students are gaining or not um, in their interactions with her. And can we relate those to other attributes of their, of their um, uh, psychological uh, characteristics, whether that's um, uh, the person's um, uh, mindset, for example, if you believe in the Dweck work, or uh, self-efficacy or other characteristics, for example. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we, we probably have time for another question or comment. Uh, we have one right at the back. Right at the back. I will try to write it down this time. In case you can it. Yeah, it's, it's the echo that I'm getting killed by. Hi, um, that's a fantastic presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm Fiona Hanley. Um, I have a question basically, um, it's about um, student engagement really, um, we're entering a period where we're increasingly involving students in decision making about, um, about their learning um, and obviously following the work that you've, you've just highlighted here, we're in a situation where actually what's good for students in terms of learning is, is not something that they necessarily want to do, <coughs> they get poor results initially or they become a harder. How then, when we're involving students in decision making, do we um, communicate to them the benefits of, of doing things in a particular way, yet acknowledging their voice at the same time? Okay. Well, I think I got that. Um, I th yeah, I think I got, I think I got that one. Uh, the it's, this is really interesting because, geez, um, back in 1922, Albert North Whitehead wrote a, a did a presentation actually to a training council um, in in England um, where he he introduced this notion of the rhythm of education. Um, and talked about the first stage of it as romance, where you're engaging in a topic and it's exciting. You don't know a lot about the details of it, but the prospect of, of what it might mean for you down the road and it's the important questions that the discipline offers you are, are, are enticing. And then we end up, he called it going through a stage of precision, which he talked about, which is kind of like you know getting the, the procedures and the details and the facts and the fundamentals uh, well, un, well understood so that we could then do what he called the third stage in the final stage, which was generalization, um, which is where we can apply it to different contexts and actually take advantage and use it. And of course, from a student's perspective, you can imagine in that particular model that um, the romance in that first introduction to something new is exciting and, and, and perhaps frightening. But then we get slammed by, as a student, uh, all of the practice and all of the, the prescriptive information that we need to, to understand and the rote rep repetition and the building of the facts and eventually, maybe with the good stuff at the end we'll get to. 
Um, so I think if I understand your question correctly, uh, one of the things we have to do is we have to bring the good stuff in periodically from the beginning. I mean, all of us who are instructors, we're in our disciplines and doing things because there's really exciting fundamental um, aspects of our discipline that we care about and which we think are really, really important. The problem is, is we tend often to think that you have to have this foundational knowledge of, of prescriptive facts and skills and the like before you can meaningfully engage with that good stuff, the things that really are important or have a real world consequence. And the reality is that that's not the case. We can, in fact, introduce those complex ideas, even if we know the student won't grasp them entirely. And we can, in fact, um, are we still on? I still have your video. No. OK.
I'm not thinking of such yes. <laughs> I don't think it's a good idea, but I think it has turned out to be a good idea. Thank you so much, Anna, for thinking of the it's been scary, it's been great, it's been fun. I've got a huge amount of it is. And um, a special clap for Amanda, please, because she's so good. <laughs> Um, and one that struck me was actually the um, great thing about old is it brings sectors together. We had this big epic focus yesterday. And it was great to see some cross pollination across the sectors. Um, I saw somebody who made you early, completely infused by a presentation um, about students as innovators. So that, that's one, um, one great thing that's happened. The second thing that I found emerging was the sort of, um, ideas around um, inclusivity. Both at the micro level of course design, um, value of students' experiences and inviting their participation through their own cultural symbol. This was the idea from um, a presentation about at risk students in, in, in Chicago, and also the need for OER that um, are linguistically and culturally appropriate or at adaptable so they can be made. So that came from another presentation, and we also think that message up in the law this morning. And also, of course, at the macro and global level, um, law is very heartfelt um, and well thought out community. It's just slightly uh, reading, it's just so wonderful. Um, and a bit of participation and um, collaboration between universities in the global world and the um, global south. Access and participation are intertwined. And Jonathan's key, but also touched on the idea of the responsibility as well. Um, but it's an extraordinary and exciting example for students to change agents and start student partnerships and have workshops to give them sort of ideas and toolkits to go away and uh, try something out in our, in our institutions and um, sort of to practice with uh, these um, teenage and students. But they didn't have anything in the room. Was it your um, Laura had the slide of the elephants, the big elephants in the room? It was wonderful. But there is an elephant. The assumptions that students will necessarily embrace change and innovation may have to work a little bit to take them with us. So, those are my three completely random um, thoughts uh, from the, emerging from the conference, I'm sure I can all be developing more ideas about it over the next few days. The next one is just to move on to some of the, my old screen. Um, so I'm going to there. I just said my four year old asked me to bring her toy. Let me get home and look at the pictures and have a chat about them. And the next one was, this is nice from Ellen and Martin, who made a big conference pilgrimage to the Alan Turing Memorial in Sackville Park. And there was the reflection there, victim of prejudice. Now let's see, the um, final one was from Amy Berlal, who has been contributing um, online. Well, I'm sure you just to us and listen to us, and listen to us, calling um, my Mr. to be real as the future is hard to predict if you could have been in an old mindset. Um, a year ago, we are the writers of the chairs behind 